Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mugala, where I interview violins from around the world. Please make sure to subscribe and hit those bell notifications for you to get updates with the latest videos on this channel. My guest today is LA-based violinist and producer. He's worked with artists like Josh Groban, The Roots, which is one of my favorite bands, and many more. Please let me welcome Christian Havel. Thanks so much for uh, joining me on uh, the Violin Podcast today. I'm just glad to be here. So, uh, Christian, for for some of the people listening in the audience today, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're based, and uh, what you've been doing with the violin? Sure. Um, I am a violinist, songwriter, and producer. I'm based in Los Angeles and New York City, but mostly in Los Angeles. Um, work mostly in Los Angeles and New York as well. Um, as a studio musician, as a touring musician with rock bands and artists that I work with, um, also recording their albums and videos here in LA or, or, or for their um, various things they're doing, and um, a classical musician still, so along with orchestras and um, lecturing and giving master classes in universities and music schools around the world. Wonderful. So you majored in the, in the violin, just I like uh, myself, you know, since not many people know listening to this podcast that people major in an instrument, you know, people major in music, people major in violin, just like you and I did. Uh, you get, got your studies at Michigan State University and also Manus. And you, were, you, were you primarily classical back then? And how did you branch out out of uh, classical? Yeah, I majored actually in international relations and political science going into Michigan State University. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and music as well. So it was, it was kind of a, a double major, which I did for two years. And that second year, it was just too much work for me. And I found my passion and love for music that I really wanted to pursue. So I just majored in music after that. Um, and then, yes, man, as I went for grad school, um, I had an interest way before college in non-classical music, um, just from basic radio play, from what my older brother was listening to, um, from going to concerts. Um, you know, we'd go to the Detroit Symphony Orchestra because I grew up on a farm um, one hour from Detroit near Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and I we went to a lot of Detroit Symphony Orchestra concerts. Um, they had great visiting artists and soloists coming in all throughout the year. Um, but then at the same time, we'd go to concerts that my brother was going to or his friends. And that really opened me up to, you know, a whole vast amount of um, music to listen to and appreciate. So I knew I loved music and I wanted to pursue it as a career going through high school. Um, but kind of in high school, waned a little bit and got away from music and did more of theater and acting and um, the academics and, and, and not you know knowing exactly if I wanted to do music for a career. Um, as, as far as doing non-classical, even at Michigan State University, it was a classical program uh, for music performance that I did, but they were just building up their jazz studies program, so that was amazing at the time. Um, they had Andrew Spate running it, and Brand from Marcellus was just there for um, the full two years, so I got to study with him. Um, also, the the bluegrass and Americana music as a as a fiddler, I loved. You know, even um, in middle school and and in high school, so I knew I wanted to do something with music outside of the classical realm, even before entering college. I just didn't know if it was possible. Um, so that was really, you know, a big struggle at undergraduate where they only push either classical or jazz and the two factions are competing as I'm sure you've you've heard from other things where it's yeah the jazz artists look down on the classical artists the classical artists look down on the jazz artists not for anything more than you know basic just ignorance because they don't understand the other um, because the best jazz artists you know so appreciate the classical artists when you when you get to know their music and what they were impacted and, and inspired to through music um so that was that was huge for me knowing that i wanted to do non-classical as well as classical but then was it possible and what was that 
looking like as a career. You know, there was no one I had to look at as, as a mentor or inspiration that was doing that, um, especially in the across the board style that I, that I knew I wanted to be able to, you know, play bluegrass one day and play jazz the next and play classical uh, movie recording the next and then being on stage in a rock band. And, um, you know, I, I kind of realized I had to make that up as I went if I wanted to live that life. So that was challenging, but extremely exciting and um, pushed me, you know, beyond um, any educator or, or teacher had. So that was really exciting. Yeah, I oftentimes think that it's actually really difficult to switch your mindset from classical to jazz or jazz to bluegrass. And usually it's really difficult for musicians and violinists. I know I'm speaking for myself. I don't know if anyone on the podcast or listening to the podcast has ever experienced this before. But how are you able to switch from classical to different genres of music so easily? I know that um, I know my mentor uh, out in Boston jokes around, you know, I could only play Haydn so well but I can't play the fiddle stuff. <laughs> so right. how are you able to switch that mindset? Uh, that was, I mean, that took getting used to, but luckily, same thing. I, I was doing that throughout my early schooling because it was even, you know, I started at age seven violin, which was much later than most of my colleagues and um, competitors, you know, all through um, either violin competitions or through school, you know, the, the, usually like three or four a lot of the times people starting. Um, but even at that later age, it wasn't just the classical music I was listening to. So it was, it was literally my practice where I have to do for my private teacher, you know, learn the Mozart concerto and do the Bach and do the, do the warm ups and scales. But then when I had extra time, um, I would put on, you know, recording of some, some solo, some bluegrass solo, or some some fiddle piece, and, and really transcribe that. So it was it was learning at an early age um, to just do that amidst myself. And obviously, it's different technique. Obviously, it's different bowing. It's different style. It's different um, you know emulation of the of who you're listening to. And that that was um, kind of reinstilled in me in, in undergraduate with the jazz program because that was um, Branford would say here this is you know, Lester Young Trio, uh, this song, I want you to transcribe it. It would be a sax solo. Um, so it would be going and, and literally playing that and transcribing it. And then, if you, you know, going back and be like, no, you're playing this violinist. I want you to play it like, you know, like he played it. You're not doing those inflections. You're not doing... Um, so that was really interesting and helped to get my mindset flipped really quick um, on different styles. And in the, say, in the recording studios here in L.A., um, if I'm going in the morning to Warner Brothers Studios and have no idea what the music's going to be, it's on the stand. Um, you know, immediately we're recording it, get that shard down. The next one goes on the stand, and it could be, you know, any any style of music, even style of music that you've never heard about. You know, it could be some Indian tabla player, and I'm doing the back backing violin part to it, and it, it, it's a style that maybe I've heard but not played so it's really on the spot needing to listen to, to take notes of what the composer's saying what the other instrumentalists are saying and recording that because you might do it in you know one or two takes literally and then it's moving on and that's out there in the world for everyone to hear you know for eternity um and there's no you know there's no going back to oh i should have i should have done this or i should have done that better it's it's, it's um the split set, second decisions are paramount and um and just thrilling to me because it's the same thing it's like you have to be on your toes the whole time um to be catching up on everything on the in the room just to to fit it just right um but the different styles yeah that's that's something that a lot of my violinist colleagues are not interested in or um you know had interest but but never got the the training for you know what i mean as a class you know classical musicians they, they know and appreciate what they can do and um but but uh aren't interested in doing those other styles um and to me i also learned an interesting point was it doesn't have to be that i would like to listen to that music in order to play it so you know i remember a lot of country music i was not interested in ever listening to it but it was i 
listen to it for the fact of learning what they were doing and understanding the music. So if I was put in that circumstance or in that position, um, I could, you know, try to emulate their style and try to fit in. Um, and I still, I still think I'm trying to master that in every, in every genre of music. It's like I'm, I'm trying to fit in as best as I can every, every session, I'm trying to be better than the last. But, yeah, you know, you uh, you bring up many very interesting points for someone who's watching or someone who's listening uh, today uh, on the Violin Podcast. You're you know you're 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 doing a lot of sessions these days. I know I've I've done sessions in the past, and I think it takes a very unique skill that oftentimes classical musicians don't have. And I think that what you're talking about that split de second decision about changing from one style to the next, not knowing what the music is going to be like when you enter in the studio. You know, um, a lot of the sessions musicians who are listening in are like, yeah, preach, because that's exactly what it is. And uh, I have a funny story really quickly. Um, I, I was doing a session out at Berkeley College of Music. Um, a, a, a dear friend of mine uh, who, I, who, is, who is now a dear friend of mine, I will go on to the studio. I'm running. I'm a little late. I'm like five minutes late. But like if you're, you know, the, the common saying is if you're not there 15 minutes before you're, you're late. So I'm running there five minutes, like right before that downbeat. And, you know, I forgot my pencil in my, um, in my car. And I go, I, 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 she's sitting concert master. I'm sitting assistant. And she goes, you know, and I go, I'm sorry. I, I forgot my pencil. Do you, do you have an extra by any chance? And she goes, dear, why did you forget your career? <laughs> and great. it was until this very day, I will never forget it. And I also mentioned it on my other podcast, the Everyday Musician podcast, where I so, I'm so blessed for that moment because I, uh, I don't forget a pencil now. So, um, yeah. But anyways, going back to the, the session. Is a huge, the preparation is a huge part of every 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 studio every concert hall every rehearsal space you go into because it's like you're you're not prepared in the least bit in some way and you know you're not gonna you're not gonna be thought of as highly so yeah great. exactly and um i definitely do want to talk more about this session work that you do um uh, you know soundtracks la is like the soundtrack capital of the world you know soundtracks are like my favorite genres one of my favorite genres um, so someone who's listening around the world, who's not living in LA, do doesn't know what it's like, uh, give, give them a picture of what your daily routine is when you go to a studio, when you go to a session, w what's it like? Sure. Daily routine is, daily routine as far as in Los Angeles, um, you'll be told, I'll, I'll get hired for the day, um, and be told what studio to go to. So in LA, the main ones, you have Warner Brothers Studios, you have Fox Studios and Sony Studios. Those are the large, large sound stages that we record uh, most of the movies in. And there's tons and tons of smaller studios that um, I might go to if it's if it's just me alone, solo, or if it's a um, you know just a, a small amount of musicians. But most of the time, the big movies that we're all seeing in the movie theaters are done in those three studios. Um, you show up, show up early, as you said. Because if you're not early, you're late. Um, but even in this case, I mean, if you're late, you're you're not going to be hired back. Because it's like every everybody, it's it's the most beautiful and amazing and perfect yet stressful um, room in all of music that I've ever experienced. Um, more so even than you know soloing in the Sydney Opera House or or um, you know Hollywood Bowl or Carnegie Hall. It's like for me, everything has to be perfectly in, in, in sync because you're expected to be perfection because, like I said earlier, it's living on, you know, forever. As opposed to a concert hall, you're, you're, there, there's spontaneity and there's, there's beauty that's brought to it that people accept and acknowledge as a live performance. For studio work, um, there's, nothing, there's nothing like that. There is passion and creativity in, in all aspects, but it has to be like the top of the game. So it could be, for instance, for me, um, it could be the late James Horner or Alan Silvestri or John Williams or um, Alexander Desplat, whoever the composer is for that film. Um, and the, the huge movie, it's the size of a movie screen in the back of the studio, so you're watching it as you go. 
the music's put in front of you. Um, every single aspect of it is run like perfect clockwork. The, the librarians are there with perfect sheet music. It's um, the conductor is there ready. Every you know you you have headphones most of the time, so you can hear everyone in the space. Um, and and you start right on the exact time. So it's it's usually um, it's usually 10 a.m. starts. Um, and that at, at 10 a.m. exactly by the second, it's like the, com the composer welcomes us a lot of the time and talks to us about the movie, about um, you know what what he feels for uh, the music he's composing. The director will be there a lot of times. Some of the actors will be there um, just to feel the experience. Um, and a lot of the time, the conductor is the composer. A lot of the time, it is not. Um, John Williams will always be on the podium. Um, Alan Silvestri will always be on the podium. Other composers will have their own conductor that we're very used to because they're there in Los Angeles. It's not like, you know, many different moving parts. Um, it's not like we're going to see a different conductor on the podium every day. Um, the movies could last three weeks. They could last six weeks of recording. They could last two days. It depends on the, how much music there is in the movie. Um, or TV show for that matter. Um, it's, it could be a group, of, you know, anywhere when I do it from one to close to a hundred when it's a, when it's a large, um, symphony orchestra, the players, we all know each other very well because it's our, it's our workspace. Um, you know, everybody, we do get there early. There's, there's a spread of food to kind of get us relaxed and eat and, and talk and congregate. And then, um, we start. Um, there's breaks throughout because it's union. Yeah, and I was I was going to ask about that. Um, part th that's one of my favorite parts about going to a session is to just you know catch up with other people that you haven't seen in a while, right. and I'm sure that's that's every day for you. I know um, I do a lot of education stuff. I do the podcasts and I, I perform mostly classical stuff. But whenever I do get a, a recording session, sometimes for a video game or sometimes it's for a movie, it's always nice to reconnect with those people and those friends. And I wanted to ask totally like nerd question is it mostly like 50 minute uh 50 minute session 10 minute break 50 minute 10 minutes in la is it like that over there that's how it always is but a lot of the time if we're making progress or we feel that we're doing something special we'll run in you know run past that and then put the tens together as a 20 um so you know it might be we'll go, go you know an hour 40 minutes and then a 20 minute break uh, but most of the time, yeah, it's it's a ten minute break for everybody to recoup, so for the librarians to get other music on the stand, for the you know the conductor to um, look at the next cues, for the composer to give notes, for the director. Um, it was it's really interesting to me that you know in New York I've done some scoring um, and recording of soundtracks, you know, and that was when I first was introduced to it. That's what I thought the norm was, and then getting to LA, it's so different because. Um, you know, in New York, the, it was never, the director was never there talking to us about the film. Um, we didn't, it wasn't as personable. You didn't have the movie screen there. Um, you didn't have the composer saying, oh, at this, you know, at this, we really want to build up to this kiss. I want that, the bass, you know, the double bass is really loud, the soon solo, the violins, or, or the explosion, everybody meet up. So that was, it's really nice to be a big part of it in that way and feel the movie and know what it's about. And for the director at the beginning to, to talk to us about what his vision is and what his thoughts were in making it. It's much more of a collaborative um, artistic process, which I love, you know, because I didn't see that in, in New York. We never had the screen there. We never saw, um, and it was, it was much more, you know, rigorous as far as um, just being a robot musician and not, um, not being a part of it. So I love that aspect of, of Los Angeles is talking to colleagues in London and, and um, in Europe as well, they don't they don't have that as, as, as much. So that was and in New York as well. It was few and far between. I would have you know a movie session every two, one every two months. Where if this is like you know you're working you're in the studio every day with different projects, and then at night going to Capitol Records to do a record date, you know, some rock artist, and then uh, with the same musicians maybe paired down in a different group. So, um, but yeah. So and you do you do still in Boston? Yeah, I do some I do some sessions in Boston. Um, there's there's a contractor out, th out there who I you know dearly love, uh, who always continues to you know call me for those gigs. Yes. And um, recently we did a we did a um, 
this was around a year ago. We, we recorded the session around a year ago and it was for like a Mongolian TV show. And then one of them was also for like a, like a video game. It was so, so random stuff, but the music was excellent. You know, um, have you, have you ever done any video game, uh, scores, um, compositionally and have you played any, um, out in LA? I have. I've never um, written for video games, but definitely recorded them. Yeah, there's a lot of them going on. And then um, we'll do these, you know, these live concerts will come through. And sometimes I've been hired for that, where it's like you're playing the music of, you know, these famous Japanese composers of like the early years of video games. We'll do that because that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, never composed for it. Yeah, I think there was a there's a little period of time when when I was in Boston, there were a couple of people who were trying to make Boston like a like a hub for um, recording soundtracks and stuff. And I think there there are a few companies that do that out there. Um, to my knowledge, I I can only think of like maybe one or two that really do it well. And um, you know, the string playing in Boston, uh, I'm so grateful to have you know, spend a lot of time in Boston as a string player. And, you know, the string player is just out of this world. I'm sure it is out in LA and New York and London. I know that on a, on a previous episode that I talk about soundtracks and how people sometimes go to London for sound, uh, for companies, they go to London for soundtracks because there's a lot of good sight reading out there. And I'm sure that is the case in LA too. Yeah. That's the, that's the one skill you have to, <laughs> you have to have. I always, boohooed it in, in the competitions and like in you know the the summer academies that like interlocking or aspen or whatever and it would you know the sight reading we were like nobody likes that it's no fun but yeah now it's my life it's crazy <laughs> yeah every every day is a new piece and i think that's really refreshing because you're not stuck with you know bach or mozart and you know composers who are, who've been dead for over 250 years so there is something refreshing about uh a living com you know playing works of living composers and um, it's, in, it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that, you know, the composers are in the room or they're in the booth with the engineers listening to the sound as things are being recorded. I know that, uh, you know, the session that I told you about just a moment ago, where there was a Japanese composer uh, doing a video game score and he was streaming from Japan into WGBH studios in Boston and he was hearing the session live and he was commenting from Japan. It was like the craziest thing. Yeah, that's so, tough with a little delay. Like, yeah, it's, it's pretty there, there is like a little delay. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, like a like a 30 second delay, but uh, everybody was like super professional. Every You could hear everybody's heartbeat in the studio and you know, they're yeah. talking going on in the booth. And I find that to be the most stressful thing because you're like, is are we going to have to do this again? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Just the slightest noise you mean, like, when you yeah. and yeah. if you have really good headphones too, sometimes the, these recordings, these live recordings, you can even hear like people in their, in their orchestra chairs, like moving from left to right. Like if you're, if you have really good ears. Okay, the funny thing is always like stomach sounds after lunch. Stomach oh, the stomach, the stomach growls. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, 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 I have to say I'm guilty of that. <laughs> and then you really hear it. Yeah. With the mic, with the headphones or not. And, and without the headphones, it's, it's much more beautiful to me because when there's no click and with no lining up, like somebody like John Williams, it's, it's hardly ever click. It's like he's organic and moving it through. Which you don't see that yeah, that's the, actually very interesting. You mentioned that. Are, are most of the sessions that you play with a click or do you have conductors who are really comfortable that are simply just like, okay, I know what to do here and just follow the music organically? Yeah, it's it's... It's not a matter more, much of um, knowing what to do because the, the conductors, you know, really know the music well, but it's the, the syncing of what's going to be edited and what's going to be cut down. And when I, you know, if, when I started out here in LA doing recordings, um, we would not be the final process of the movie, meaning, you know, we, we'd see these longer clips and we'd score to them and then the directors and the, the producers would, would cut the movie down and cut, in essence, the actor's work, the director's work, the crew's work and the musician's work, cut that down. And now they've realized that it's the final thing they should do so they're not wasting money on the music. So I would say above 90% of films were the last thing. So it's like for Family Guy episode, it can be within five days of it airing. Um, with movies, it's it can be within four to five weeks of the movie coming out, which was, you know, before, maybe a year before, because the, the directors would have liberties and, 
um, editing. It's, it's now much more about the money to where the producers are putting these rigorous rules on. They're like, why, why are we paying all this for these you know, cuts? And then you're going to cut it down. We're wasting money. So it's, it's literally the, the, one of the last thing that's done, which is interesting. So the click pertains to that um, with something like Family Guy, because it might be a, you literally have 11 seconds in there. And with something like um, Seth MacFarlane's TV shows that I do, it's, it's bringing in a lot of classical and other music. So it might be a Wagner lick of seven minutes, or I'm sorry, seven second Wagner lift a, a, a clip of, you know, Valkyrie or something. And we're, we're doing the actual things, fitting it right in there. So instead of being organic, we might have to do it to click just so we fit it in. And then the next thing is some, you know, going into a Looney Tunes esque like a typical cartoon. Like yeah, so it's so time is money essentially. Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's it's not about um, you know the conductors not knowing the music as well. It's like they just really have to fit it in and and writing on the spot. The composers are you know all the time like changing chords and doing it. That's fascinating to me how fast they can you know say third horn, fifth horn. You know, like I want you like on this note, this note, this note here. Let's do this. The strings change this. You guys and, and you're, you're catching it. You know, you have to be listening. So it's like basses, you know, see the low staff, you know, violin, you know, and then it's, and it's, we do it one take and then we move on. So it's like, you have to, you know, you don't want some errant F sharp in there when it's an F, you know, it's, it's yeah, um, no kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah. You kind of have to be on top of your game all the time. And I think I give so much respect to, you know, full-time session players out there. I know I have a few colleagues out there who do sessions and stuff. So yeah, could, I mean, that was, that was so great and that's so valuable for anyone who um, actually wants to get started in music and what it means to have a career outside of classical music because um, you don't necessarily have to be an orchestral musician. You can have orchestral skills, but you, you can have a different variety of skills of you know, playing chamber music here, being an educator there, playing, being a session musician here. And I think um, nowadays, compared to maybe 50 or 60 years ago, you have a lot more options in terms of what you want to do. And yeah, totally. Do, yeah. And keeping, and keeping the classical as part of your life, because most of my colleagues on this core orchestra that we're recording every day, they all are in the LA, uh, LA Opera and LA Chamber Orchestra. So it's, it's, you know, doing those at night and the session. So they're definitely still keeping up all their skills and staying in that classical world, which is amazing. Yeah. You also mentioned that you do, uh, you're a producer. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um, produce uh, music for, for film and television and for artists. So um, the singer songwriters and um, singers that are, that are putting together albums, I will produce their songs and albums or executive produce. Um, now working on an album that I'm the executive producer on and producer on, I think 80% of the tracks. Um, so it's being there in the studio, choosing musically what, you know, is going to work for them as a singer or musician, uh, instrumentalist and guiding them through and running, you know, the sessions and the whole recording process for their albums. Um, it's something that I loved the idea of being out in LA and seeing, you know, the producers that I grew up with idolizing like David Foster um, and Quincy Jones, what they were doing, what they were kind of shepherding and, and helping create when in fact not being the actual musician on it. So that was new to me, you know, cause, cause in Michigan and New York, you hear producer and it's, it's usually the, I would think of the on Broadway, it was like the money man and the, you know, the guy who, who raised the money and put the money in and earned all the money. Um, but out here it's much more, you know, learning that producer on music is the creative aspect of that. Um, and the person that's kind of um, binding it all together. And I love that. Um, and with, with David Foster, for instance, um, I don't know if you're familiar with his stuff, but all through like eighties and nineties, all the, you know, from Whitney Houston and, um, Celine like Dion and you know Michael Bublé. Like he started all these artists and created them and made them what they were, um, and and made their albums along with them in their career. It was fascinating to me. And and I I do I'll do private shows with David. So we'll David will be on piano and it'll be um, like someone like Josh Groban or another singer, and then me on violin. And we'll we'll do these 
private parties in people's homes or in you know amazing like corporate events where we'll play and then it's on the on the travel and the plane there and back it's like talking and picking his brain and, and hearing about what he does is fascinating to me or what he has done um so i knew it was something i wanted to do in, in addition to being a um you know solo artist and session musician so i love it it's a whole different avenue of of um, music and creation for me so i really yeah i really enjoy it I was wondering if you could uh, clarify something. This is mostly for me because you said producer, and I know that on end of music, uh, end of movie titles, there's also music supervisor, right? So yeah. can you can you deter, can you explain to the audience what the difference differences are between being a music supervisor and, and a music producer? And specifically on a movie, you're saying, for instance? Yes. Yeah. On a on a TV on show, a, movie. Yeah, so on a movie, on a movie, a producer title really is. is separate and have nothing to do with the music producer that we think of so it so it is the person that brings maybe buys the book rights for a movie and sends brings in this director and brings in this you know if that director doesn't only work with a composer like steven spielberg will only work with john williams now it's now alan silvestri has taken over um if it's a director that doesn't have a specific producer or a young director that producer will choose a composer to bring in choose a film editor to you know bring everything together um, probably will say, I want these two actors, you know, the casting director brings that in, um, brings the money to the plate. Um, you have an executive producer, producer in movies, executive producer is either money or name. So you'll have, if a, if a movie says executive producer and you say, oh, oh, J.J. Abrams did this or Steven Spielberg, you know, they could just be on there for name to bring in other people as executive producer. It's usually the money or, or uh, notoriety. The producers do all the work. Um, you know, associate producers are, are there day to day, like running the film set. Um, producers are bringing in the money and the ideas. Um, music supervisor is usually uh, is legal. It's usually lawyer background, as well as um, pulling in um, songs and you know songwriters and artists for for that specific movie. So a lot of the time, people think music supervisor has to do with the composer. Not as much. It's about the 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 songs that are purchased and brought in um one of the biggest in la is randall poster you'll see his name on you know tons and tons of movies um so it's he's actually doing the contracts and reaching out to um the roots and saying we you know we like this song and this album we'd like to use it for our, our, our movie you know and they'll say how are you going to use it are you going to make fun of it or is it playing in what aspect and then there'll be a price they'll say the music supervisor will be like i have this much money you know for that song um and, you know, usually, you know, for someone like Roots, it would be probably twenty-five dollars or $30,000 for that song to use in the movie. Then it's negotiated whether there's revenue or residuals or it's just a buyout. Um, so that's the music supervisor. And the, in the recording aspect, you know, producer is a very different um, position. But as far as producer and music supervisor on movies, that's what it, that's what it is. Yeah, thank you for yeah, thank you for clarifying all of that. Yeah, because I know that I've seen music producer on on the on the on the uh, on the credits. I see music supervisor, and um, originally I thought that music supervisor. Sorry to cut you off. Music producer in that aspect that you see in the title will very likely have produced the actual soundtrack. So you'll have so that that answers that question. You have producers, executive producers, associate producers. That's on the film. But if you have music supervisor, music producer. That's that's an added person engineer in the booth, recording, maybe producing the actual soundtrack that comes out. So for most of the movies now I'm doing, the soundtrack will also come out, and that's that's the music producer. Yeah. Okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, thanks so much. That was most uh, for anyone who's listening or watching. That was more of a personal question for me because that's been on my mind for years. So thank <laughs> you. I have I have I have a professional answering that. So. Um, so Christian, you've you played alongside some pretty big names. You mentioned Josh Groban. Uh, I mentioned the Beyonce, Jay Z, The Roots. You've been playing with, you know, I'm sure you play with these people on a on a on a frequent basis. Uh, what, what what what's it what was it like to get a call uh, to be able to play with an artist like that? You know, it's like a kind of like a breaking moment for anyone. Yeah, it's it's still to this day, Eric. I mean, it's like a a dream, or I pinch myself when I get the call either from the manager or from the actual artists themselves when it's like hey you know come out of the studio i want you to work on this album or 
go on tour. It's like, I'm still, I've, I've never gotten over that. It's still a very exciting, like, you know, running around the house screaming, getting excited to do it. Cause it's, it's, it's like as a boy and as a musician and as a violinist, it was like always something I aspired and, and looked at not knowing if I could. So now to be a, a musician that I idolized or looked up to their violinist is crazy, you know, and to been, like to keep getting asked back. So, um, yeah, I love it. And the touring for me, I mean, we've talked about the, the studio work, um, and, and the, the touring for me and, and playing on the artist's album is still probably the most fun and like pinnacle for me um, because it's, it's such a part of, you know, getting the, being on stage. I love that's the, that's the thrill for me. So it's being on stage in these concerts at, at venues that I've, you know, listened to recordings or seen people at or, or dreamed of playing at, like being soloing on those venues with these artists. It's amazing to me. Um, and now started, started out where it was kind of more background musician and back in the band for the musicians. Now I only take, um, solo jobs. So it's like for Barbara Streisand, I'm her solo violinist now. Um, Bernadette Peters is another singer, Broadway musician on them, her solo violinist, Josh Groban, um, same thing. So when these artists go out on tour or do recordings, like they ask for me and it might be a, a studio orchestra as well, but I still get the solo um, with the artists. If we're going to different venues and play the Hollywood bowl and it's, it's with the LA Philharmonic, I'm still the soloist in the band and, you know, get to, they'll give me usually intermissions. I, I put that into my contract too. So it's, if the artist leaves the stage halfway through the show after an hour for a break, um, they'll they'll say you know now i want to introduce to you christian Havel, you know and, and, and literally it's like i get a 15 20 minute chunk of improvising doing my own compositions going into some song that people recognize then having the orchestra come in um you know i love it and that's that's also part of the producing aspect too because i've been producing that part and making it my own of what i've always you know it's like what dream scenario i'd like to perform on stage and it's like i get to do it so it's kind of fun um but yeah for me that's still working with the actual artists one-on-one -on, -one. on tour, you know, flying around with them. Um, just, it's like being on vacation and making music. I love it. I still really love that. And being in the studio with them. Yeah. I, I haven't been on tour for a long time, uh, but I, I did a, f a couple of orchestra tours and um, flew across, across the country for different corporate events and, um, performances as well and I have to say like there's something about you know being a traveling musician that just every everyone is so attracted to like you know you get to pursue your dream you're traveling to different places but um, oftentimes people forget that if you're a musician and you're traveling full time that sometimes it could you know if you're being on the road sometimes you want to be like in one central location and uh, I think oftentimes people overlook that you know, that's, you know, that was the good side of being a traveling musician. Now there's a, there's a realistic portion, right? Where, uh, in my other podcasts, uh, you know, uh, everyday musician podcast, I interviewed DJ spooky and DJ spooky was like, before the interview, he was like, this was the first time in like maybe 20 years I've spent more than two weeks in New York at every, any given time. Cause he travels so much. Right. So, um, how just a quick question how long have you been on tour um on like a, on a single program yeah and that's it's an amazing question because with a lot of the artists i'll get called and it'll it'll be you know a, a tour to to promote the album and you know they'll say hey we we need you for um a month and a half because we're going to do all the late night shows we're going to do morning shows we're promoting the album um and I'll be thinking, oh, yeah, I can, you know, I can do a month and a half. And then let's say, and then we'll have, you know, a month break. And then we're going on tour for a year and a half. <laughs> I was like, I'm still thinking a month and a half. And you're like, I could fit that in. Um, so it's, it's a tough thing. I mean, it, it's, I, I've been fortunate enough to keep my studio career here, my soloing with various art, uh, with orchestras, you know, once or twice a year, um, keeping my relationships with these artists and still not having to be a tour musician. That's, that's the hard thing too. And that's a lot of the, the conservatories and, and uh, universities I lecture at. It's, 
you know, I, I say you need to really pick if you want to be a studio musician in LA, if you want to be a studio musician in London, if you want to be a rock violinist, um, a rock saxophonist or whatever it is and tour the, to the world. Cause you really, in this day and age, you have to pick one. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't recommend doing, following the, the path that I did to try to do a little of everything because it doesn't, it, it doesn't work out, you know, for a lot of people because you have to, you have to drop one or the other. If you're out of LA and not being a studio musician for too long, you're not going to get called anymore. Um, so for the artists I work with, like the, the, uh, with the roots, a small tour, you know, it was over like three weeks. Um, for Josh Groban, it'll be no more than like three and a half months. And then, you know, it'll be a break and I might not do the next tour leg in, you know, Asia or in Australia and be like, Hey, I, I can sign on for this much. Um, for Barbara, she hardly performs anymore. So when we do, you know, we did a show in London for 70,000 people last summer and it was like, just the build up to that and rehearsals. And then we did that show and that was it. And on the way back, literally in rehearsals leading up to that London show, we were like, Hey, on the way back, knowing that Barbara doesn't like to fly and she's driving across America, let's do New York Madison square gardens. Cause we hadn't done it in I think 12 years. We hadn't played Madison square garden. We had done Barclays center a few years ago, but, and then Chicago. So sure enough, we had, we added two shows to that tour and elongated a little bit, and in between, I would fly back to LA. And, um, so I never took, to answer your question, I never, I've never taken those long tours. Um, three months ago, I was in talks with Dixie Chicks. They had their new album out um, about going out with them. They had never had a violinist. He was a violinist in the band, the three girls, but they were going to have me as, a, as part of the band, which is going to be amazing. But it was like a one and a half to two year ordeal. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, I'm not that, I'm not that player. Most of my, most of my bandmates, that's all they do, Eric, is, is tour. Like the Grow Band, Josh Groban's band, they are touring, you know, with different artists. One of the, the, the bass player goes to Stevie Wonder and Josh. The other is Paul Simon and, and Josh. And it's like, that's all they're doing. You know, they're living in hotels. They don't, and I, I've never had interest in that. Um, and I have two young little boys. So it's like, I don't want to be away, you know, for long. So. Um, yeah, to answer your question, I've never taken the long tours. I've always turned them down and tried to take a chunk of them. I think it's also, uh, I think, I think what you, you, one of my questions for you for towards the end of the podcast was, you know, what, what would you give, what kind of advice would you give the aspiring musician who's listening or watching to the podcast today on how to become a professional musician? And I think part of your answer was just like make good decisions that are good for you, not for people, not for, not that are decisions that are good or for people around you, but that are good for you because you might be, you know, you might look on paper saying, oh my gosh, this salary looks amazing. These cities look amazing. I get to travel the world. But at the end of the day, if you're that kind of person, if you're watching, awesome, I applaud you. I, for one, am also not that person, Christian. I like, I like to do things every, you know, every once in a while, I like to travel, yeah. you know, like, you know, kind of keep things fresh, but to be traveling all the time, it just gets really exhausting. I, I can, I can, I can, you know, agree with you on that. Yeah, I totally understand. It was the same with me. And, you know, early years of traveling was much different early, you know, the tour buses and the planes, the jet, I mean, now luckily it's like the artists I tour with, they'll have a private jet or they'll have, you know, the, the tour buses are, I would choose a tour bus in some cases rather than flying. It's like luxury and beautiful and they take care of us. So, um, but even that said, like, I'm like you, I, I, I couldn't just live on the road. I, that's not something I would be interested in doing. Yeah. Also for my mental health and also for my well being. you know, like it's, um, you know, God forbid, like an emergency happens across the world and yeah. you're, you're not oh. there, you know, especially, you know, with, you know, for musicians who are families, which a lot of the cases, a lot of soloists in the classical music world for, you know, for anyone who is interested in the classical music world hope you are, they still, still exist. <laughs> um, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of these soloists do have families as well. And they, I'm sure they also put into consideration the amount of time that they're spending away from their families, a lot of time that they're uh, spending on the road touring with Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. And, Absolutely. You know, like, you know, like yeah, there's, yeah, there's a reality to as well. It's like, that's part of the thing I always get in my contract. Like, um, like my, my sons are coming, you know, you're, you're going to have, this is what it's going to have. I need an extra room you know, we need to make this 
comfortable backstage, extra dressing room for them. I mean, it's, you, you have to get that in your contract. So it's like, I'm going to be bringing my children with me. Um, that's part of the deal. Like you're, you're, you're having me, you're having that, you know, it's like, it's, it's like whole. you're, it's like you're paying for my kids to be there. <laughs> and then for me now in my, the place in my career, luckily, and, and it's a blessing, but I can, I can say, I can ask for these things in my rider. I can say, this is, if you want me, this is what I need. You know, if you, and to back in the day, being scared to do that or ask for a little and they'll say no. I'm like, okay, sure. I still going to do it because I need to get the job. Now it's like, I can ask for these things. If they can't give them to me, I say, you know, sorry, but I can't take it. And, and most of the time they'll come back and be like, okay, we'll give it to you. They're like, great. That's good. You know, it's like, you have to be a, a manager as well and manage your career and your life, you know, so you're saying, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, I, I feel like they're playing hard to get. It's like, okay, we, we, we'll think about bringing your kids along. They come back. It's like, oh, of course we'll bring your kids. <laughs> right. They're like, they're trying. Yeah. It's all about, it's all about the money. Unfortunately. It's all, it's all, it's all a game, but uh, I do have a couple more questions and then we'll play sure. violin podcast trivia. And I, um, but one question that I didn't ask you is how long did it take you from the moment you stepped foot in LA to where you had that breaking moment with some of these artists, what was, how, what was that time span? A lot of people think that you, you get, you get famous, get rich quick, right? Especially like if you're an artist or a violinist and uh, sometimes people often forget like the amount of work that we're doing just to get to where we are today. People often look at you, what you do now, as opposed to what you did right. 10 years ago. So can you, can you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, for me, I mean, it, it's still, it's still hustling and still a lot of work to, to get the next job. But um, to start off, I, at, at Michigan State University, it was, you know, I wanted to be a musician, as I said, and I'm thinking, oh, it's, I can be a, one of the three. You can be a classical orchestra member, you can be a quartet or a soloist. And it's like, I'm not, you know, at, at that point, I was like, I'm not good enough to be a soloist. Quartet, that whole life of, like we said, traveling around, it's not, you know, it's the whole life doing that. And that's your family as opposed to having a family. And the orchestral, it just wasn't that appealing to me. But I knew, okay, if I'm going to be violinist, that's what I have to pursue. Um, not, you know, the professor or, or, or teaching aspects aside from that, because I wanted to perform. Um, so in Michigan, when I was going to Michigan State, I was taking orchestral auditions for experience and to, to kind of get those under my belt as well as doing competitions um, and was doing well, like was getting to finals and, and winning the competitions. And then um, the Lansing Symphony Orchestra, which was capital of Michigan, I took that audition. Um, it was, you know, for some section spots and, and first violin and associate concertmaster. And I, I won the associate concertmaster job and I didn't expect to. Um, and was like, oh, I, I can't accept this because it's like I'm undergraduate and all the, the amount of work it took, you know, with just the rehearsals and everything, can I do this? Lo and behold, I did take it. Um, the concertmaster uh, was a British violinist and very, very classical only, you know, no aspirations like I had to do the other styles. So all the rock bands, all the singers, all the Broadway shows that would come to Detroit or to Lansing or Grand Rapids in Michigan, when they needed a violinist, which a lot of Broadway shows do, they pick them up in the towns instead of carrying them. A lot of the rock bands would be like, oh, we're going to pick up a local, you know, trio or string, string quartet to put on stage with us. They would ask him and he would, you know, say no. So they would come to me and ask me. And I said yes every time. So it was these Broadway shows where I was like, it opened up a whole nother aspect of music to me. I was like, oh my gosh, I've always wanted to go to New York and to, to have that as a career and and, and, and knowing, oh, they make the same salary as the New York Phil, but with less work. It was like, this is crazy, you know, and you get to record the album. It was like, it was, it was falling into place. I was like, I could do this. Then playing on stage with these artists and rock bands and every so often in rehearsal, if they got an inkling that I could improvise, they'd say, oh, you know what? Let's, let's have you do a little solo there. And I was like, so that was starting and parlaying into this career for me because it was showing me oh i can do these different genres when i did go to new york um i, I held that associate concertmaster position through undergraduate and actually took another year of undergraduate just so i could keep making money as an orchestra musician and you know spreading out my being in school because i was like i love it you know i love being in school and learning um so i took a fifth year then i moved to new york um it was between new york nashville or la um 
Nashville to kind of be on stage as a bluegrass country artist, New York to be Broadway or a studio musician out, out in LA. Um, I went to New York and, and started connecting with the, the tours and the music directors and the conductors that came through Michigan and I played with, and they were on Broadway, you know, conducting shows. And I started going in. The first one was Andy Get Your Gun, and they invited me to sub there right away. And it was like, this was amazing. So I was working, and same thing, going to Manus, getting my, grad, my master's in performance. Um, so it was, it was all fitting in there. That fast forward to um, composers and conductors of film music, meeting them in New York and them knowing the Broadway shows I had done. Um, there was a show called Last Five Years, which was the composer on, on piano and a five piece band. And we were on stage and you know it ran for a very short amount of time, but we made this album, the soundtrack, and it became a cult hit. You know, and the violin solo was all throughout it, and some improvising and, and, and this one conductor had said, have you ever thought of coming to LA? Cause you're, you know, we love, we love you on that. Um, my composer friend and I love you on that on last five years soundtrack. I was like, what? I was like, of course, I always thought of that. And then, you know, he had eventually hired me for Superman Returns, which was John Williams music and John Ottman recreating it. It was like, that was my first huge solo or uh, my first huge studio work in, in LA. So it was cross genres. They were seeing other um, performances and recordings I had done or been at live shows on Broadway. And that was the same thing, like these worlds of music appreciating each other. Classical musicians don't appreciate Broadway at all, you know, like we were saying with jazz and classical. But to now, since Broadway is so popular, you can have these albums that the majority of someone that knows music be like, oh, I've heard, you know, I know that the musical Spring Awakening or Wicked and be like, oh, that was you, you know, the violin soloist. And be like, yeah, They're like, oh, my gosh, you can you actually can play the violin. <laughs> I do this kind of thing, you know, would you like to help out on that? So it, um, it's all, it's continuing in this, to this day, like someone will know my work from one thing, be like, oh, I, I heard you on a, a Barbara album, or I was in a concert, you know, at the Madison Square Gardens when you played with Josh and you were soloing. Um, it's, it's a lot of that thing, you know, even Berkeley School of Music, like I had a connection through them with the dean and someone else who was at the Boston Garden and her, they were like, that was amazing what you did on violin, will you come and, you know, do a lecture and I did and it was like oh it's it's so cool it's like this cross pollinization of worlds um and it's it's always you know this the same thing it's like what I started with and I'm still continuing to do that like trying to trying to make connections and hustle so but it's always work to answer your question it's like it's non-stop <laughs> promotion uh, there's no there's no easy route is what you're trying no. to say well you can't just show up and, and phone it in you know it's preparation like you said earlier it's being top of your game because there's so many, you know, I'm not by any means the best jazz violinist, best classical music musician, best bluegrass, but it's like I can do them all and I can be in the room and, and uh, do it a certain way. It's like, but you have to be top of your game because there's so many other musicians that are waiting to fill your spot. And violinists, especially an ever growing, I mean, violinists, they keep, keep, we keep multiplying. It's crazy. <laughs> the music schools keep popping us out. Well, Christian, I appreciate everything that you've said so far in this interview. Um, I think any, I think your the information that you gave was just so valuable, even for me. You know, uh, just by listening to your story, listening to um, what you've got, you know, what you went through through school and trying to self, um, trying to discover what your niche is, and it turns out that all genres are your niche. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but. I, but now before my fun part uh, of the podcast, which is the Violent Podcast Trivia. And nice. for anyone who's watching for the first time, welcome to the Violent Podcast. Really appreciate you uh, being here. And for those of you who don't know what po Violent Podcast Trivia is, my guest needs to answer uh, five questions in 25 seconds time. And all they need to do is get three out of the five questions right. Uh oh. They, they get a prize from me. Okay. And these are all like music, uh, you know, I, I read your bio and you're like, you have experience in all genres. So I've tailored the questions to those okay. genres. All right. So um, I have my, hold on, I'm going to take my watch off here. Wish me luck, everybody. So, sorry? Wish me luck, everybody. Yeah. So here we go. 
and these are gonna go quick so I'm just gonna read the question if you if you're not sure just say pass I'll repeat the question all right right okay so three two one go this composer originally wrote the four seasons the volume this legendary jazz violinist name ends with Ellie Stefan Grappelli which composer developed the 12 tone method uh, Schoenberg? The performance of this piece resulted in a riot in the year 1913. Uh, Rite of Spring? The world record of the cyclist playing the violin backwards. Uh, how, oh, cyclist? Um, 23.8 miles. Okay, all right. <laughs> Time, all right. Uh -oh. I, I think I have to revise the the 30 second time I can't read that fast you know <laughs> maybe your answer yeah the questions don't don't take a part of the uh, 25 seconds yeah okay I, that's good note so um, all right so how'd you do how do you think you did well I mean I can't read 12 tone I was like I, I've learned I know this and then uh, 1913 you said it was it was 1913 you started about the riot and I was like okay maybe it could have been 18 if you're talking about Beethoven but then 1913 not, not Stravinsky, but maybe, yeah, that was a, that was a, I threw that one out there. But we'll, we'll go through them one by one. So we'll see, we'll see if Christian gets uh, three out of five <laughs> questions right. I think I might have to come up with a new game or like make these trivia questions tougher or something. And it's like, yeah, the cyclist one, I, I've never heard of that. So he was actually on a bicycle or a unicycle or? He was, this person who set the world record was going backwards playing the violin for a quite a long distance, so we'll get to that. Okay. It's okay, but first question. This composer originally wrote the Four Seasons. Vivaldi, easy peasy. I, wanna, I, I start them off easy and then I get, they get progressively harder. Uh, second question. This legendary jazz violinist's name ends with Ellie. Stepan Grappelli, you got that one right also. Third question. Which composer developed the 12 tone method? You hesitated here. I did. Sure. I was like thinking, yeah, I was like Webern, uh, Berg. I was like, but Schoenberg, it was, yeah, right? Schoenberg is the correct answer. Uh, right. Second VE school. Uh, next up, the performance of this piece resulted in a riot in the year 1913. You said Rite of Spring? Rite of Spring was correct. Hey. And, uh, and do you remember what, what city it was in? Um. Let me think. It was not in, obviously, Russia. It was in a European city. I would guess Vienna or Berlin, but I'm not sure. It was Paris. Paris. Oh, Paris. Oh, yeah. I knew that too. Yeah, gee whiz. Now that I'm, it's all coming back. So the fun question was how many, uh, how, what was the distance of the cyclist going backwards while playing the violin? Over 60 kilometers, he played the violin riding a cycle. Can you believe that? It took him five hours and eight minutes. It, writing it backwards or playing the music backwards? <laughs> that was I, I don't know. <laughs> it was one or the other. That's food for thought. The Leave a seat. comment in the, in the section below. Uh, Christian, look, you, you got four out of five questions right. So every winner who gets uh, the three out of five questions right minimum, they get a violin podcast mug from me. So I'll That's send great. one I'll, I'll send one mugs. your way. I so appreciate mugs. Great. Oh no, you're so welcome. And thank you so much for um sharing your knowledge about the violin, sharing your knowledge about what it means to be a musician, an artist, a violinist based out in LA. I definitely learned a lot. And if you learned a lot about the violin podcast and the knowledge and the and the amazing tips that Christian gave during this uh, podcast interview, please make sure to subscribe. And I'll also put a link down in the description below so I can leave Christian's information. He's probably going to be on tour somewhere in the world. So I'm sure, or if you're out in LA, I'm sure he's going to be performing the Hollywood Bowl soon. So Christian, thank you so much. And I hope to catch up with you soon. Absolutely, Eric. I appreciate, I appreciate your time. And this was really fun. Thank you. You're so welcome.